The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. <clears throat> Today is day five of this eight-day session here at Mountain Gate in December 2020 uh, in honor of the Buddha's enlightenment, which made it possible for uh, each one of us to learn how to open to that profound truth of existence that we can and all the, uh, the freedom that comes from that. The, the peace, the underlying quiet joy that comes from a deep enough awakening. And, and of course, uh, we're not talking about one awakening. Multiple awakenings are, are uh, what we're search, searching for, working towards, because the deeper we go, the freer we are. And the freer we are, the more our innate compassion and wisdom can function in our daily life, and that is the whole purpose of it, really, to relieve suffering, to relieve suffering wherever suffering is. And there's certainly plenty of it in this period of time. I'd like to, since it is the traditional Rohatsu Sashin, I'd like to um, share with you uh, today's Rohatsu exhortation by the great Zen master Hakuin. Agui Nekaku, who was born in the 1700s and 1600s actually, and died in the 1700s in the 18th century, and very early on was uh, terrified of falling into hell. Now, these days, many of us are feeling quite anxious. There's a lot of reasons to feel quite anxious these days in the world. Um, set aside the American political situation, which is still undergoing trauma. And, and there is the, the obvious potential, very close potential, that any of us, all of us, most of us, could die of this COVID-19 uh, virus, the coronavirus that is uh, taking the world by storm, uh, in particular, America. And last I checked, there were over 206,000, no, million cases in the United States in one day, new cases. So this is, this is a formidable challenge, just this illness alone. And then when you take along with it all the histories uh, of trauma, so many people have had, and it's well known now that a very high percentage of human beings have experienced some level of trauma growing up. And now with all the wars, with all, all the uh, terrible chaos all over the world, uh, it's even more so, I would suspect. And so that's adding to the level of uh, bulk anxiety uh, human anxiety that is rampant right now. And the only antidote I know, other than of course being careful to um, be safe, live safely, don't take extraordinary risks uh, with your life, and be careful in terms of the, the instructions to stay as safe as possible in this pandemic era. Uh, social distancing and masks and so on. Um, and we do the best we can, and the rest is up to our karma. But underlying all of it, we don't have to be carried by fear. We don't have to be plagued by anxiety. There are remedies, and <clears throat> one big remedy is to do mindfulness meditation, to do Zen practice. Zen practice is, is mindfulness meditation taken to a deeper level because along with simply being utterly present as possible, 
as a, as a mindfulness exercise, and that that's twenty four seven. That goes on regardless of what we're doing, where we're at, whether we're on the cushion uh, in the zendo, or whether we are out and about buying groceries, um, walking the dog, uh, doing the dishes, any of the myriad things that human beings do during the day. And the deeper version of it, that is Zen practice, is to add a, an element of, of perplexity, of, uh, of a yearning to return to something it felt like you knew uh, long ago and was so important to return to, uh, a faith that we, we can become free, uh, a faith that so many human beings prior to our birth have done this practice and experienced tremendous freedom from it. And again, here, when I talk about freedom, I'm not talking about just doing whatever you feel like whenever you feel like it. I'm talking about the only real freedom there is, which is the freedom to be at ease, not to be caught, to be embracing our innate compassion and wisdom, regardless of circumstance. So even if we are, like Jacques Le Serran was, in a concentration camp, where death is everywhere, every minute, where starvation is the, the way of the day and the week and the month and the year, where people are dying of, of all sorts of means, whether they were gassed or shot or stabbed in the middle of the night or strangled by their fellow prisoners or dying simply of lack of hope. Still, he found peace and joy. And it made a difference for himself and it also made a difference for other people in that hell realm because there was something about him once he had that profound awakening that he, he was able simply through his presence to give peace to people who were freaking out in terror in that environment. I think here of uh, Yamasaki-san in Japan, who actually sewed this uh, kimono, this underrobe that I'm wearing. Um, she was a wonderful lay supporter of the, all of us at Sogenji. And at a certain point, she got sick and she got sick with stomach cancer, which is pretty prevalent in Japan, unfortunately. It's taught it up to either the fact that they eat a lot of pickles, which, which is a lot of salt, the pickles are salted pickles, or uh, that, and, and this is also being seen in America too, that the food they are eating, the tea that they are drinking is, is too hot and it's damaging the cells in the esophagus, in the stomach, and that is resulting in, in cancer. So she did, she got cancer. And uh, she was in a great deal of pain from this cancer. Uh, she had surgery, they, they told her they got, uh, well, I don't know if they told her, but they told her son that they got the cancer. They removed the stomach cancer, but um, what they didn't say uh, was that it had metastasized. And so while they got the, the stomach cancer uh, and they removed her stomach, I believe, they, they didn't get the rest of the cancer and it, and it went wild through her body, causing her immense suffering. And when the suffering got extreme, she would call for uh, the Roshi, Harada Roshi. And he would go and simply because he was sitting next to her at the hospital bed, she was freed during that period of pain. It says something about the power of mind. And we can harness that power of mind to let go our preconceived ideas about who we are, to let go our skewed perceptions, to uh, see through our conditioning 
And instead of reacting to situations, responding clearly and, and compassionately and wisely through the practice. And Hakuin was a major player in this because when he was born, he was uh, born into a family on the, on the one of the post roads. In that era, uh, the daimyo, the ruling lords of the different uh, uh, parts of Japan, <clears throat> so something I suppose similar to state governors in the United States, were required to go to Tokyo twice a year uh, for an extended period of time and uh, for uh, significant political reasons. It had to do with uh, wiping out any extraneous income they might have so that they couldn't foment a resistance or a coup. Uh, but, and, um, and it worked. <laughs> but twice a year, each year, these great, amazing entourages would travel from their various um, points of, of uh, living otherwise uh, and, and, and walk or go on horseback or go in carts, depending on, on the amount of wealth involved and the level of, of uh, status a person had. Um, not just the daimyo, but his court and all of the, the hangers on. And uh, he provided entertainment for the journey, which was an, generally several days long. And so these great possessions would be coming through Hara, the town that Hakuin was born into. Uh, they even had jugglers and dance dancers and entertainers of <laughs> all sorts that would come along with this entourage. And so there were a lot of people to be put up in various hotels and uh, places of rest along the way. And there also was needed fresh horses to be um, exchanged for the tired ones that had done, just done a leg of travel. And so Hakuin's family had one of these um, inns. Uh, it was a mid-level inn one, not one uh, where the daimyo would stay, but it was a uh, high enough level that his courtiers would stay in it. And that's how they made their living. Hakuin had uh, at least an older brother, and I think there were five kids altogether in the family. And uh, very early on, he began to be worried about falling into hell. Uh, you've heard many times over uh, that that he was the usual boy, and uh, he did rough things and he did uh, things that caused pain and suffering, not in purpose necessarily. Although pot shotting the crows, I suppose that was intention to to kill the the birds, but it was certainly considered not much other than a sport, as hunting. Uh, is in many quarters these days as well. And this began to worry him more and more. And his mother, being a devout Buddhist, although she was not a Zen Buddhist, would take him along with her to different talks and, and um, you know, religious plays and so on, and where he definitely got the idea that if he got to become a Zen monk, he could escape hell. He, even, even at a, the young age of seven, eight, nine years old, he would, in desperation, go up behind his house uh, on the hill where he found a rock that seemed to him to appear to be like Kanon, the Bodhisattva of uh, compassion. And he would chant uh, and chant and chant and 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 spend quite a bit of time up there in hopes of balancing out the the negative acts that he was convinced that were going to send him into hell and when he was 14 years old he finally managed to convince his parents after at least at least a year of begging to allow him to become ordained and he was actually ordained at shoyinji 
uh, which was a viable temple at that point in time, a Rinzai temple. Uh, I think his uncle may have been the, the, the priest there. It certainly at one point his uncle was a priest there. Whether it was at that time, I'm not sure. And then he, he went and trained in other temples. <clears throat> and went through everything that all of us have been going through, through our Zen practice history, um, excitement, discouragement, and, and so on and so forth. And at one point he even quit and apprenticed himself to a calligrapher because he thought he was really not gonna make it as a Zen monk. It wouldn't after all save him from, from the, the horrors of hell but he did rather quickly go back to Zen practice after being inspired by an um, ancient Chinese monk whose name is pronounced Jimyo in Japanese, who was so determined to come to awakening and so determined to do it uh, through the night and, and avoid going to sleep in his earnestness to keep on practicing and keep on searching that he would take an all a, um, a, a very sharp pointed instrument that is used to make holes in things and, and stab himself in the thigh whenever he started to fall asleep, to wake himself up and uh, so he could practice instead. There are uh, less painful ways to do that. When I was at the Rochester Zen Center, I remember in Rohatsu Sashin, uh, of course, the, it's very cold and snowy in Rochester at that time of year. And I would sit in the, in the Zendo very, very, very early in the morning. And uh, when I began to feel sleepy, I would go outdoors and walk in the icy cold in the garden until I, I woke up enough to feel like I could manage another uh, hour or so in the Zendo. And then, they, then I would repeat it. Uh, doing kinhin in in the garden in the icy cold, which was very bracing, actually quite quite a nice uh, practice. It uh, it it just felt really nourishing and right, despite the fact that I wasn't getting a whole lot of sleep. We can, um, if we're falling asleep and we want to continue the zazen because we are dropping deeper. Then, then to go into the bathroom and splash cold water on our on our face, uh, with our eyes open, and that that shock of that cold water will wake us up as well. Um, one of the things we used to do in Rochester, in order to wake up early to uh, be able to do yaza in the early early morning, which for me was the most exciting time to do it, because it was so quiet, and almost every everybody else was not up at that time. They all stayed up at the end of the sitting instead, uh, was to just drink a lot of water. And at a certain point, you have to get up to go to the bathroom and then you just stay up and go to the Zendo and, and sit Zazen. There are many, many ways to affect uh, increasing time in the Zendo. And, and when I talk about increasing time, we're talking about quality time. Because we can sit on the cushion, we can put the hours and the minutes in and just do our practice uh, superficially. And that won't do anything for coming to awakening. But to really give ourselves to the quest, to no matter what comes up, to allow ourselves to feel the energy of it in our body and be curious about it. Who is feeling that feeling, those sensations? What is the truth in that moment? Where is our original face in that moment? And in this way, our practice gradually, gradually, gradually deepens. And then with the right trigger, we have a Kensho experience, a sudden, an uh, insight into a deeper level of practice, a deeper understanding of what life and death really is. And the extended out breath is remarkably effective in bringing about 
such moments, although they don't necessarily happen at the end of the breath. In fact, I'm not sure most of them do happen at the end of a breath. Uh, they happen seemingly unrelated, but they actually are quite related. They're coming about because of that practice, that, that letting go that is required in order to do the susokan properly, uh, in combination with the, the curiosity, the yearning, the, the, the sense that this original face is, it's, it's like I can almost feel it. So let me do a little deeper zazen, and maybe I will be able to comprehend it intimately. And it does happen that way. So, on the fifth night, the master said, intensive training sessions known as seshin, which means to touch the mind, continue for periods of 80, 90, and 120 days. How about that, folks? Eight days is a piece of cake, yes? Since the goal of all those who take part is to clarify the great matter, while the seshin is in progress, one leaves uh, no one leaves the temple gates, and no one speaks unnecessarily. Practice is carried out with a spirit of dauntless, dauntless, indomitable courage. Dauntless, indomitable courage. Determination. Determination and faith. And this subtle, no-name questioning. It's an incredible combination to bring one to awakening if we persist. In recent years, there was a man in a village near here who carved a stone image of Fudo the Immovable. And uh, although he didn't carve it, uh, Hawkwin, as you heard this story before, earlier in, in Sashin, uh, the man was a wealthy man. In fact, he was one of two, the two wealthiest men in uh, the, uh, this, uh, a different village, not the village of, of Ohara, where Hakuin lived, but a different village. And in fact, it, it, it seems to be rather interesting, but apparently there was a river that ran right through the middle of the village. And one of these men lived on one side of the river and the other lived on the other side of the river. At any rate, this particular man was asked to provide the funds to have a statue carved of Fudo the Immovable. He enshrined it beside a waterfall in the mountains of Yoshiwara. One day, as he was watching the water tumbling down the, the cliffside, his gaze fixed on the bubbles that formed in the pool at the bottom of the falls. Some moved over the water for a foot or so before disappearing, some for two or three feet and some continued floating two or three yards. Watching their progress, the man's past karma enabled him to perceive the impermanence of worldly existence. The realization shook him to the marrow of his being. He now found it impossible to find peace within himself. He chanced to hear a man recite a passage from the Dharma words of priest Takasui, quote, Courageous beings attain Buddhahood in a single instant of thought. Lax and indolent beings take three long kalpas to attain nirvana. Uh, and a great burning determination rose in him. He entered the bathroom uh, of his house. Uh, this is a, uh, the, the Japanese bath. Uh, bathroom in Japanese traditional homes and even in modern homes is not the same as the bathroom in American homes. Uh, and the, the toilet and the wash basin and so on are in a different part, uh, quite closed off from the Japanese bathroom. And in a temple, it is one of the three locations of silence. One, one being the zendo, one being the bath, and the other being, if I remember right, it was the kitchen, but I don't, I'm not sure about the third one. It's a sacred place. And when one goes into the Japanese bath in a temple, one does a prostration first. Actually, one does three prostrations and lights a stick of incense. 
setting the uh, atmosphere for this deep contemplation. And indeed, there is a koan, 16 bodhisattvas enter the bath. And when 16 bodhisattvas entered the bath, the encounter with the water triggered an awakening in each one of them. But that's not the answer to the con. So one actually washes outside the bath. There's usually a spigot and uh, you have a bowl. You fill the bowl with water and um, you scrub away and clean yourself quite well and rinse yourself off uh, because the actual bath water in the bathtub is, it remains there for, for quite a while. It's, it's reused. Uh, and in a family situation, the, uh, usually it's the father that goes in first and then the mother and the kids uh, one by one so that the whole family bathes in that same water. Sometimes uh, special scents are, are put in the water, it's something like bath salts. And, and the whole thing is a, is a deeply peaceful, unhurried experience. So this man was wealthy enough to have a whole guest area with its own bath, and he went into the bath because uh, he would not be disturbed there. It continues. Sitting down, he straightened his spine, clenched his fists, opened his eyes wide, and began doing Zazen with great determination. Now that's Hakuin. We don't need to clench our fists. It's, it's a more of a gentle, probing, curious practice. It's not, it's not a striving practice, and this is very important because we can um, strive ourselves into a, into a corner, paint ourselves into a corner, so to speak, if we try to force the practice. It's, it's a balance. And when asked uh, about this, the Buddha said, it's like uh, a musician who has his lute, and if he tightens the strings of the instrument too much, uh, the sound is terrible. If they're too loose, there's no sound. If it's just right, it's perfect. And that's the way with practice. It's set up as a model many times over. We don't, we don't dig our fingernails into our palms. We don't clench our teeth. We hunker down like Einstein did and let our mind settle deep into our hara with an openness to possibility that something might bubble up as it did for Einstein. A deep truth might reveal itself. And of course, we use the extended out breath as a sokan to uh, effect a focus. Delusory thoughts flew thick and fast through his mind. Anybody had that experience? The obstruction of the demon realms rose up to confuse him. But because he threw himself body and soul into the great Dharma battle, and again, here is Hakuin at his best, he finally severed life at the roots and entered into the formless realm of deep samadhi. At first light, hearing the sparrows chirping around outside the building, he found that the body had completely disappeared. And suddenly he saw his eyeballs pop from their sockets and fall to the ground. It sounds like quite a macho. He felt the pain of his fingernails gouging into the palms of his hands and realized his eyes were back in their proper place and he rose from his cushion and began to walk about. He continued to practice in the same manner for three nights. On the third night, when daybreak came and he got up to wash his face, he noticed that the trees in the garden were now somehow totally different. He consulted the priest of a nearby temple about it, but the priest was unable to provide any answers. And he then decided to come and see me. 
he set out for Shoinji in a palanquin. That was how wealthy men traveled in those days, and women too. But in this um, carry chair, it's sometimes called, uh, where it's it's uh, uh, an enclosed chair or cabinet in which um, the rider sits and uh, there are poles on either side back and front of this contraption and they are picked up by strong men four strong men will shoulder the poles and run with it there is one of those still at sogenji that belonged to the daimyo who donated his his uh, summer home to become a temple He then decided to come and see me. He set out from sh for Shoinji in Palanquin. Upon reaching the high pass at Satta, the splendid prospect of the ocean at Kura came into view far below. At that instant, he knew beyond any doubt that what he had grasped was the truth that plants and trees in the great earth all attain Buddhahood. Proceeding to my temple, he passed through the fires of my forge. In other words, he came into Sanzen and was questioned and subsequently penetrated a number of koan barriers. He was an ordinary man with no prior knowledge of Zen practice whatsoever. Yet in just two or three short nights, he achieved a realization. The great victory he gained in the struggle against delusion, delusional thought was the result of courageous determination and single-minded resolve. How can you full-fledged Zen monks fa fail to generate the same fierce and dauntless spirit? So that was Mr. Yamanashi's experience. And now I'd like to share with you, um, let's see if I can find that page. Well, let's start with this one. This is, again, we're sharing from uh, this book as great companions, Poison Blossoms uh, from a Thicket of Thorns, uh, the collected works of Hakuin. So this is an informal talk on New Year's Eve. Tonight, the old year ends. Tomorrow, the new one begins. In houses everywhere in the land, people will put on their best clothes to welcome it in. Placed over every door are pine saplings with roots, oranges with green leaves. Actually, those are mikan. They're not exact. I guess you would call them mandarin oranges. They have a wonderful taste. And I discovered some of them in a grocery store in Santa Fe called Satsuma oranges. They're beautiful little, very tasty, seedless, uh, sort of a tangerine type of thing, but they don't taste like tangerines. They're much sweeter, not as acidic. <clears throat> However, even at such a time, isn't there a place of vital importance completely untouched by either new or old? What is it? What is beyond? new or old. No eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, no color, sound, smell, taste, touch, or what the mind takes hold of, nor even act of sensing. What is it? What is it? And then he gives a poem. The air clears, wind combs through the young willow's hair, the ice melts, ripples wash through wiry old beards of moss. When do you find proof of this vital place? Where do you find proof of this vital place? Tapping the floor with my staff, I say, Confucius prayed for a very long time. And the reference to Confucius is that uh, he apparently at one point said that there was no need for him to pray to the gods 
because in everything he did, he was so present in modern vocabulary, basically. He was so present that, that each moment was a prayer. And we can affect that as well. When we are truly present, it really is a prayer. And not only is it a prayer, but we are unwittingly experiencing the moment just as it is, without any preconceived ideas about it. The deeper we can go in presence, the more we will realize what existence really is. We're born. We live. And we have choices in how we live. We can be constantly sucked into our technology. We can be constantly sucked into uh, weighing and measuring our possessions versus, versus those of our neighbors. Or we can be utterly present or increasingly present. And it's very different then. What I was trying to find, and hopefully I, I, can, I can find it soon, is um, was Hawkwind's sharing of the story of, of um, Dogen's awakening. Here we are. On the seventh day, on the second day of the seventh month of the first year of Bao Qing, which was 1227, when he was 27 years old, I believe, Zen Master A. He Dogen set out with his teacher, Myo Zen Hoshi, in a trading vessel bound for distant Sung, China. At the monastery on Mount Tiantung, he requested and was granted an interview with Zen Master Ju Jing. He made three vows to the master and said, although I am but an insignificant young monk from a far off country, I rejoice that karma from my past lives has enabled me to be admitted into your Dharma assembly. Please master, in your great pity and compassion, teach me the true essentials of the way. Ju Qing lit a stick of incense, placed his palms together in Gasho and said, Ever since our Zen school began, the direct, undeviating transmission of the authentic Dharma from master to disciple, it has always had as its fundamental principle, never leaving the training hall, and has had Zazen alone as the authentic way of practice. Today, Zen students in temples throughout the land may sit many hours in meditation without lying down to sleep. But because they do not encounter an enlightened master, they never learn the way of entering true meditation. Because of that, the Zazen they practice differs not in the least from that espoused by the heretical teachers. Even if they continued performing such practice until the end of time, they would never be able to enter the great jhana uh, or meditation of the Buddhas. Dogen performed three bows and said, in your great pity and compassion, please teach me the correct way to enter jhana. And Yu Jing lit incense, performed gasho, and said, Brother Gen, uh, Dogen, when doing so Zen, you should place your mind above the palm of your left hand. That was his first instruction. Dogen performed three bows and withdrew. And some days later, he entered Yu Jing's chamber made three bows and said, I placed my mind above the palm of my left hand as you instructed. Now both my hands have totally disappeared. There's nowhere to place my mind. 
Ju Ching lit incense, performed gasho, and said, Dogen, you should make your mind fill your entire body. Make it reach each of your 360 bones and joints, each of the 84,000 pores of your skin, so that not a single place is left empty. How do we do that? Through utter awareness. Through sinking deep through the, the zazen, through the extended out breath, and letting go any distractions, continuing to sink deeper and deeper and deeper. And what we enter is through that, we enter a samadhi. A few days later, Dogen entered Ju Jing's chamber, made three bows and said, I did as you instructed, placing my mind throughout my body. Now both my mind and my body have fallen away. It is like a brilliant sun illuminating the vast heavens, although its round shape cannot be seen. This time, Ju Jing lit incense, performed gasho and said with a smile, Brother Gen, for Kalpasan end, you have been revolving in the cycle of birth and death. Today you have entered the great and true jhana, where defilements do not arise. Preserve and protect this, never let go of it. Dogen performed three bows, three additional bows, and then withdrew with tears in his eyes. And um, Hakuin says, this is one of the secret teachings of Soto Zen. I learned about it long ago from an old priest when I was staying at the Inryo, Inryoji in Izumi province. I've obtained many good results from practicing it, but I've not readily taught it to others. I thought I would wait until I found monks whose minds were deeply committed to the way. Every time I heard about how earnestly you men were practicing this winter in the face of arduous difficulties, goose, goose flesh would rise all over my body. I only regret that the kitchen larders are empty and I am unable to provide you with the proper sustenance for the cold winter nights. There apparently was a, a uh, famine in Japan and there literally wasn't, wasn't food for the temple. Many monks died. This is the reason I've been so talkative tonight, unconcerned about losing my eyebrows, which is uh, traditionally considered that if a, a, a teacher talks too much, uh, they, they, their eyebrows drop because they're, you cannot express the truth through talk. The truth is beyond words. People might call me an old Dharma reprobate, someone who having lost his nostrils has entered a dark cave to dip water that has been lying, oops, stagnant for a thousand years. They might say that my talking about Soto Zen has caused the drowning of many of the valiant heroes of Rinzai Zen. Having no way to rebut these charges, I can only clench my left hand into a fist and gnaw on my fingertips. Why is that? It is said that you should sell your bedding and buy a cow when the winter solstice falls at the beginning of the month and sell your cow and buy bedding when it falls at the end of the month. Well, what about this year when it falls right in the middle? What do you do then? And Aquin took his staff and this this uh, telling of how Dogen came to awakening, um, the way it's spoken might or might not be clear to you, but he was so focused on the practice that. Uh, ultimately, everything disappeared, and that is the the uh, origin of his his um, words: "Body and mind dropped, dropped body and mind." 
And Dogen also said, to study the way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. And that is what was happening there with his concentration and his focus. And he continued, to forget the self is to become enlightened by the 10,000 things. To become enlightened by the 10,000 things is to remove the barriers between self and other. And with that, I thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the four vows. <laughs>